Good morning. Good to see you again. Um, this week on Friday, we had a package come in the mail. You could tell by its weight, by its size, that it was a book, but it was all bundled up. And the return address, it came from someone by the name of Reverend James Bunting. It's addressed to pastors, Westby, Coon Prairie, Lutheran Church. And I have to admit that my first response upon seeing this package was one that was not all that positive. Because often we get in the mail books, magazines, letters, pamphlets from people who, and I'll put pastors in quotes because obviously there are many different people that can call themselves a pastor by various reasons. And you can tell by the content of the letter or the content of the book or the magazine that they, their sole purpose for sending this to us is that they are trying to advance a certain theological, social, political agenda, and it is the truth, according to them, and all churches must be professing this, and if you don't, then you're not a true church. And we get a fair amount of that time to time. And so I must admit that my first response upon seeing this was one that was negative. And so I, I even kind of made an announcement in the office. I said, oh great, here's something else. And then I started to look at the package a little bit more, and I could tell that this was a it wasn't a mass-produced packaging. It was one that someone you know, had kind of done personally. I also noticed that it cost $22.16 to send. So there's a you know, fair amount of cost. And I think, well, this isn't something that's gone out to hundreds or even thousands of places. And so I opened it up. And not only was I wonderfully surprised by what was in it, but I was a bit ashamed of my negative assumption when I first saw it. What came was this book. It is the Lutheran Hymnary, printed, this one, in 1938. Engraved on the front, it says this. Presented to Westby Coon Prairie Lutheran Church in memory of Nagnethe... Ah, A-G-N-E-T-H-E. -E. There you go. And Simon Mockrood by their grandchildren and great-grandchildren, Easter, 1939. I went, oh. <laughs> Reverend Bunting including a note in which he explains that in the mid-1960s, he had the opportunity to work with Pastor Austin on Saturdays during for confirmation and was also involved in some extent on the Sunday services for about five months well, he was a student at Wartburg Seminary. Does anybody remember this man? What's Reverend Bunting, B-U-E-N-T-I-N-G. He actually now is a retired Anglican priest. He writes a note. I came across this book while going through his extensive, my extensive library. I do not recall how I acquired this book, but I now want to return it to its proper family. I hope it will bring them great joy as well as being quite a surprise. So inside the front cover of this book are listed then the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Simon and Negethi Makrud, who all were alive in 1939. There were many more to come. But they're all listed right here. And on this list is a Paul Mockrude, who, of course, married Mary Mockrude, who, of course, then had a child, Patrice Mockrude. And for, as all of us know, it was a tremendous financial gift by Patrice and Mary Mockrude, which not only established our mission endowment fund here at, at Westby Coombe Prairie, but also made possible so many other improvements, not only that we made to our building and some other ministry possibilities that have really changed and dramatically affected the life of this congregation. So I find it fascinating that this package that I have originally perceived to be something that was negative turns out to be a significant historical gift, this book, by a family to a congregation. 
in which then 75 years later is the recipient of a financial gift by heirs of people of this family that aren't even mentioned in this list because it was before Paul and Mary got married. That has ex- and this gift that they made has expanded the possibility of ministry for in the years to generations to come. And the person that made the connection to this gift is a retired Anglican priest who lives in Canada, <laughs> who for a few months worked with Pastor Austin. I find it amazing how God works in mysterious ways sometimes. This book will be up front later. If you want to take a look at it, please come. So you may be asking yourself, well, that's all good and that's all wonderful and interesting and good, but what does it have to do with these three stories of the 17th chapter of 1 Kings about Elijah? Well, let's see. This portion of Scripture is where we first meet the prophet Elijah. It's the first time we come across him. And what do we know about him? What he first does is he's going to announce a drought that is coming to the land. He announces this to King Ahab. He then flees to a remote land where he is reliant upon ravens, birds, to bring him food. And then he goes to the city Zarephath where he's a reliant upon a poor widow and her son. And all they have is this little speck of food that is left. And their plan is they're going to share their last little meal together. And then they're probably going to die because they don't have any other food. But they share this food with him. And then miraculously this little bit of food never goes away. It keeps feeding all of them for many days. And they're rec- he gets recognized by her as a, someone that's quite powerful, this man of God. And then her son becomes so ill that he dies. And Elijah pleads with God, and he says, you know, bring this son back to life. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, our text says. And the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. I think these stories and actions of Elijah... They do a couple things. First, they lift up that all life is made possible by the Lord alone. And the importance of the word as it is spoken, in this case by Elijah. And these stories, while on their own, are miraculous. And they point to the power of God working through Elijah. But I think what they're most, they're, at their most powerful level, they give us, they tell us, Give us some insight about how God is at work in the world by these things that seem to be unconnected to each other. Prophet Elijah, a king, a drought, a raven, a widow, and her son. And the story is about how Elijah is going beyond the borders of his town, beyond the borders of his king, beyond the borders of what separates humans and animals and how the ravens feed him beyond the borders of how food can sustain us, beyond the borders of even death and life when he raises this child back to life. Elijah's ministry is a model for what is yet to come in the ministry of Jesus. And we see this pattern with Jesus repeated as well, right? He feeds the 5,000 with just a little bit of food. He brings people back to life. He heals them miraculously. And of course, he then breaks the ultimate bond of death with his own rising, his own ascension. Now, Elijah foreshadows or announces the power of God to grant and sustain life, but Jesus is the one who comes and makes it real. Not only for people in his day, but for you and me. And we get connected to this story because here in a little bit, In a few minutes, we're going to come forward down this aisle and we're going to receive this little bit of bread and this little dip, sip of wine that has no business sustaining us for more than a moment. But we know this is something that feeds us day in and day out and week in and week out. Much larger than ourselves and much larger than the moment. And these old stories, these moments, specks in time really, They connect us to a generation of faith of Elijah and the widow and her son, to a people that were going undergoing lives and times so very different from our own. But yet they too speak to the search for meaning 
the struggle for relevance. For we too, in our own lives, we've been hungry for things. Maybe even hungry for food sometimes. We too have wondered, why has someone died in our life, in our midst? We too are fully reliant upon God for life. And it's these little stories of Scripture that kind of show up in our lives like this hymn book out of nowhere that connects us to a time and a people and a place larger than ourselves, but we rely, but we're fully reliant on God just as we are. And this hymn book showed up on Friday, connected, connected me to a time and a family that lived in a time that's different from my own. The preface of this book, written by the committee that put it together, and I understand this to be the first English hymn book that was printed for the Norwegian Lutheran church bodies of this when they first started to be formed in around the turn of the century. The preface of this book ends with this little paragraph, the group that put this book together. They said, It is the prayer of the committee that the Lutheran hymnary may prove no small factor in the efforts made to unify the various Norwegian Lutheran church bodies of our land. They put this in here because those Norwegian church bodies weren't unified, were they? And it reminded me, because sometimes I get caught up in my own little small time and space, it reminded me that I make the mistake of thinking that this is the only difficult time in the history of our church and faith, and this time in which we are, our practice of life together as Christians is dramatically shifting and changing. And sometimes I get caught up in, oh, woe is me, it's all so different. You know, long ago in 1939, it was so much easier for all those Lutherans. And I'm reminded that they too had differences, that they too were trying to fight through things in the changing day and time. And I'm reminded and connected to a time by a family and an Anglican priest who I do not know. By a simple book that throughout history the church has had pains of growth and the people have always searched for ways to be unified in Christ. I'm reminded by the words of scripture today by Elijah that this raven, the widow, her son proclaimed that God is the source of life and all these seemingly unconnected people come together in the story that impacts me here today on this in this moment. And I'm reminded that God will lead us through our struggles. And that's what fascinates me about how God works in this world. Seemingly unconnected people, unconnected events, times and places all coming together. Connected by the grace and love of Christ whose peace be goes beyond all borders. We live in a time in which our differences with one another are highlighted more than ever whether it be social differences, political differences, how we view the world, how we understand God at work in the world, all these things. And this all reminds me that in our differences, let us not pull back from one another, but rather engage. In our disputes, let us not be separated or distant. In our pains and in our hurts, let us not just put them on a shelf, thinking that time and a little dust will soothe them and make them go away. But rather, my friends, let us be inspired by Elijah, by the widow, by all the people involved in the giving of this book and the sending of it back here. Let us approach the borders of our life and world with the peace of God. And let the peace that only He can bring break down our borders break down our separations that we put between ourselves. Thanks be to God. Amen.